Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to today's Play Attention webinar. My name is Gwen Sorley, and I will be your host today. I really appreciate you taking out some time today to learn a little bit more about ADHD and reading comprehension and recall. This is a topic that is very uh, important to me, as many of you know, because I've been looking through the list of attendees here today, and several of you have attended our webinars in the past, and I've talked about how I've used Play Attention with my students and clients for over 25 years now. Also, my background is in education, and I have a master's in education with a specialty in reading instruction. So ADHD and reading instruction, those two topics are very important to me. And we've realized that it is a very important topic to many of you. I think this particular webinar has had the most registrants ever. And we do a lot of webinars, as you know, um, but we had the most registrants that we've ever had. So I do appreciate all of you coming today. And as I was going through the agenda for today, I did realize that there's a lot to say on this topic. And uh, I do want to cover everything that was in your registration. So I want to talk about how weak executive function and ADHD affect the reading process. We want to provide you with tips and strategies to help and also talk about how play attention can assist in the reading process and strengthen certain skills that are needed in order to be good learners and strong readers. So I do wanna cover all of that, but in developing this webinar, I realized that it's going to have to be at least two parts. So we are going to touch on all of these topics, but just know that we are going to follow up with part two. So as I go through the webinar, if you have any questions or you want to type in topics or uh, areas you would like covered in the next webinar, please do type those in the chat box and we will keep those for our next webinar. So let's go ahead and talk about reading. Now, many of you may think, gosh, you know, I love to read and yet my child doesn't like to read at all or he really struggles when he tries to read. I wish he had that same love of reading. And uh, I've heard many parents say that in the past. And also a lot of parents will come to us and say, you know, he struggles in reading so we got him a reading tutor and she's a really good tutor and yet he still struggles with the process. And so it's really important we look at what difficulties are you having as an adult with ADHD or your child may be experiencing that interrupts that reading process. And when we look at that, it's important we look at a couple of different things here. Let's talk about the difference between a learning disability and ADHD. If a student has a learning disability, there may be a deficit in one or two areas while that student can actually perform at or above average in other areas. Whereas with ADHD, ADHD affects the entire learning process because it affects cognitive skills. Many individuals with ADHD have weak cognitive skills that lay the foundation for learning. So that's typically why they struggle with reading and the reading process and comprehension. So let's look at the different cognitive skills that are typically weakest for people with attention difficulties. Those include focus, processing speed, working memory, impulse control, and filtering distractions. If we break each one of these down further, let's look at how each one of these areas affect reading. So just focus, we'll start there, right? The number one topic usually when we're talking about ADHD is the individual's ability to direct and sustain attention to low stimuli activities at will. You know, we often talk about how ADHD is really a misnomer. There is no one with a complete deficit of attention. Usually they have great attention 
uh, it's just diffused over a variety of things. Or if they're very interested in something or if it's high stimuli like a video game, they can actually hyper focus in those situations, right, where it's hard to draw them away from it. And a lot of times you may look at your child playing a video game and think, gosh, if she only could focus that much when it came to reading or it comes to her homework. So they do have that ability to hyper focus on high stimuli or high interest. Unfortunately, with reading, that's a much lower stimuli type of activity, right? You have to be able to attend. You have to be able to direct your attention to the printed page, which is very low stimuli, and read the words and process them and draw up the meaning. So it is very difficult for many individuals who are struggling with attention and focus. Now, sometimes there are students who are great readers. That is their interest. So they can actually hyper-focus when it comes to reading. But more often than not, this is a difficult process. So if they're having a hard time paying attention to the printed word, it often makes it difficult for them to sound out the words. And it even makes it difficult for them to remember or recognize sight words quickly. Now remember, sight words are those lists of words you get in kindergarten and first grade, second grade, third grade. Those are the words that you should not need to decode. You should not need to try to sound those out. You should just recognize them as soon as you see them. So this, that, the, of, there, those are examples of sight words. And those are really critical when it comes to reading fluency. And many times individuals who have a hard time with focus have a hard time recognizing those sight words. This may lead to them stumbling over words because they're having a hard time decoding. They may skip words because they're not focused on the process. And of course, that is going to affect reading fluency and comprehension. Now, the next area we need to look at is processing speed. Processing speed is the pace at which you take in information and make sense of that information. Many individuals with attention difficulties often have slow processing speed. So you may think, you know, I know I'm bright. I understand what you're saying. I understand the material. It just seems to take me a little bit longer to process the information and give a response, where it seems others are just giving responses. It may sometimes take you a little bit longer. Maybe your student, it takes them a little bit longer to process the information and give a response. And that is very typical. However, if it there is slow processing speed, that means reading is going to take them longer. And so if reading a passage or reading a page or a chapter is taking a prolonged period of time, it does make it difficult for them to remember the information they read and to understand the information that they just read. So when you ask your child or your student to summarize or to answer comprehension questions, they often have to reread the material in order to give an answer. And that's oftentimes due to slow processing. Also, if they're a slow processor, they know that things take them, tasks, subjects, reading, take them a little bit longer than their peers. So if you are to give them a really long reading passage with a lot of words on the page, or you give them a section of the book to read, they may become easily overwhelmed because they know that that task is going to take them a long time. So especially when they get into you know, middle school and high school, you might see them starting to shut down. They'll avoid doing that task altogether because they know it's going to take them a long time. So not only do we have to look at improving focus, but we also need to look at improving processing speed. And of course, working memory. Many of you have uh, heard a lot about working memory and you can think about this as your mental workspace. It's where you're able to take in information, 
hold that information in memory, manipulate that information in some way, and then give a response. If you have weak working memory, it makes it very difficult to comprehend and have reading fluency because it is key to comprehension and reading fluency. It allows you to hold on to information and integrate that information with prior knowledge. And that's how all learning takes place, right? You have information that you've learned previously, and now you're taking in new information. You hold that information in your memory, integrate it with your prior knowledge, in order to have new learning experience. So working memory is critical to the reading process. So you may often have students who can decode words. They can read the words. They will read to you beautifully. But then when they're done reading, they don't remember what they just read. And that is due to weak working memory. Also, there's impulse control. And a lot of times people think of impulse control as just the behaviors, you know, being um, hyperactive or uh, acting without thinking or uh, interrupting people as they're talking. That's what we typically think about impulse control. But when it comes to reading, if you are very impulsive, that means you're just going to rush through the material just to get it done. And because they're rushing through the material, they'll often miss important details. So we need to teach that inhibitory control so that they are going to focus on the reading, process the information, and be able to hold that information in their working memory. So everything is related, focus, processing speed, working memory, and impulse control. And finally, let's talk about distraction, the ability to filter distractions. We want them to be able to direct and sustain their attention to the task at hand while filtering out all of that unnecessary stimuli. You know, I talk to so many adults who will say, it's like there are a million different TV sets going on in my head all at the same time. So it's not really, again, it's not a deficit of attention. You have great attention. It's just that you're paying attention to bits and pieces of absolutely everything around you. So your student may be able to tell you a little bit about what he read, but he also knows what the bird's doing outside. He knows what Johnny's doing in the back of the room because he's paying attention to everything. And if you're trying to pay attention to bits and pieces of everything, then of course, again, fluency is going to be interrupted and there's going to be a lack of comprehension. Another distraction that probably many of you have experienced, especially when you're using an e-reader or reading online, you'll suddenly come across the word pie in your reading material. And the next moment you find yourself, you've left your reading assignment and now you're Googling pie recipes. So it's very easy to get off track, especially when you're doing electronic reading. So that's a form of distraction as well. And you can imagine with all of these distractions, you're going to lose your place and comprehension is going to be affected in a negative way. So these are truly the skills that we need in order to be a good reader, an effective reader. But these are the cognitive skills that are often weak for individuals with attention difficulties. So I think it's important to remember this because it may give you a new perspective on why your child or why your student or why you yourself struggle with the reading process. You know how to read and you can, again, you can get your child a great reading tutor who can teach reading. And if that tutor is focused on teaching reading, they may not really be getting to the root of the issue, which are the cognitive skills. A reading teacher or a reading tutor is going to teach how to read, not necessarily how to improve focus and processing speed and working memory and impulse control and filtering distractions. And that is where the difficulties really lie. 
in those cognitive skills. So we have to focus on what we need to do in order to lay the foundation for strong reading, okay? So you may be thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure how my cognitive skills are. You know, I know my child struggles with attention, but I don't think he struggles any more than, you know, his peers. So if you are interested in finding out exactly how your cognitive skills skills are currently. We do have focus assessment available. Focus is a norm reference test of attentional control. It is computer-based. It takes about 20 minutes for you to complete. And at the end of the 20 minutes, we receive a full report that tells us how you performed compared to the performance of your peers. And then we need about a 30 minute block of time to review these results and uh, talk about the different areas. We're going to be able to talk about uh, processing speed, impulse control, distractors. Are you more distracted visually or auditorily? It gives us a lot of information. And we're not going to just talk about the weaknesses. We'll also talk about a play attention plan and how we can customize an executive function training plan for you in order to strengthen those core cognitive skills that right now may be weak for you. So if you would like to do a focus assessment, just type focus in the chat box. And as a webinar offer, typically focus is $50, but with this webinar, you'll get that at half price. So it will be $25 and that will include the assessment itself, which we'll send to you as a link with the instructions. And then we'll need about a 30 minute block of time to review the results and talk about a plan. So the focus assessment is appropriate for any age above the age of five. So five all the way up through adulthood. Again, if you'd like to do focus, we can actually look at how your cognitive skills compare to that of your peers. And then based on that, we can make a plan of action. So let's talk about some uh, tips that you can try. If you are a distracted reader, what are some steps that you can start incorporating now to help improve the reading process? One is to choose the right environment for you. And this means you might need to choose and select and try out a few different types of environments. And you wanna take into account distractions, lighting, comfort level. Keep in mind that this might not be the best choice, right? Being in that comfy couch, it may be appealing and you may enjoy it, but it might not be the right choice for you. Now, if you're using reading before you go to sleep and reading before you go to sleep is really great because it's it helps de-stress, it's relaxing, and it really does help a lot of people go to sleep. So if you're using reading in that capacity, then of course the comfortable couch or your bed, that's a good environment for that purpose. But if you are reading for work or you're reading for school, the comfortable chair, the comfortable couch may not be the right choice because when your body associates that location with comfort and sleep, you're probably going to sleep more than you're going to actually read. So think about your environment and find the best environment for you. You may want to consider earplugs or using white noise. Um, earplugs works for a lot of people by filtering out those distractions. But remember, with earplugs, you're only filtering out auditory distractions. You have to keep in mind that there's also visual distractions. So you may need to shut the blinds or shut the door, eliminate the amount of uh, a visual uh, stimuli in your environment to help you stay on track and not be so distracted. Eventually, of course, we want to teach you how to be able to filter distractions on your own so you don't need aids like earplugs and white noise, but it's a good place to start. Also, a great idea is to exercise before you sit down to read. If you have a lot of material that you need to read, 
a great idea is to do a little bit of exercise, a little bit of physical movement before the reading process. Because as we've discussed in many of these webinars, exercise in study after study has shown to improve learning, improve focus, improve recall, just 10 minutes of a brisk walk, or we talked about in the past that study that was done with school-age children, and they cycled for 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes of cycling, they had improved focus, they had improved ability to filter distractions, improved ability to uh, control their impulsive behaviors, and improved memory for up to an hour after that little boost of energy. So if you can, and I know it's not always possible, but maybe these summer months, you can start incorporating a little bit of exercise before reading. And then also start scheduling a time to read. You know, when you say, okay, we're we're going to get to our reading sometime this week. You know it's not going to happen. So start scheduling specific times when you're going to read. And the more you do it, if you're going to read Mondays through Fridays from, let's say, 7 a.m. to 7.15 even, start small and then gradually build yourself up over time where you're extending that period of time for longer and longer amounts of time. So start small and gradually build yourself up, but make a point of doing this daily and then you'll develop that habit of reading. Now, when we're thinking about time, it's also important to keep in mind the other activities that are going on before and after reading. Because sometimes parents will call and they'll say, you know, I told him that if he uh, he could play his video games for 30 minutes, but after 30 minutes, he would have to stop and sit down. It was time to do his reading homework. And so we would have to do at least 20 minutes of reading after he was done with his 30 minutes of video games. So you have to think about that. You can equate that to bringing your child to an ice cream sundae bar, right? And saying, for 20 minutes, I want you to eat everything on this ice cream sundae bar that you want. Have ice cream and gummy bears and sprinkles, whatever you want. But then when I tell you to stop, we're going to sit down and we're going to eat this bag of carrots for 10 minutes, okay? Now, when you do this, you're overstimulating the child, right? The child is on high stimuli and you are indulging your child. And then all of a sudden you say, okay, it's time to stop. And now we have to transition to this bag of carrots. You know that your child who has ADHD has a difficult time oftentimes with transitions and transitioning from that enjoyable activity to something very low stimuli is going to be a difficult transition. So think about the way you approach reading time. So think about the uh, video games, kind of like dessert, okay? Ideally, if you can start with something like exercise and prepare the brain for learning and for the reading process, great. So you do a little bit of exercise, you do um, some of your reading, and then as your dessert, your reward, then you go into that higher stimuli activity, which might be a video game, okay? So take all of that into account when you're looking at helping your child with transition and controlling emotions and what you're doing before the reading process and after the reading process. You may want to use a bookmark above or below the line as they're reading down the page. And this helps them track and stay focused. Now, a lot of times people will use it below the line, but try it above the line because oftentimes that helps individuals even more. And you want to stay engaged with active reading. So make certain that at times you're using a highlighter or you're actually physically taking sticky notes and you're putting those sticky notes on the page because when you are actively involved and it may just be writing down notes as you read, when you can add that other component 
um, you are actually going to improve your memory, your recall. So that's a great way to lessen distractions and stay actively engaged in the reading process. Remember to select a variety of material and change your attitude towards reading. So you want to have lots of different reading material, the reading material that you want to read and you're excited to read and the reading material that you have to read. Because if you're always reading just material that you have to read and you never read for enjoyment, then you're going to not really enjoy the process because you're not reading for pleasure at all. You're always reading material that's assigned to you that might not be of high interest to you. So if you are always thinking, I don't like to read, I'm not a good reader, I avoid reading, well, then you're not going to like to read. You're going to avoid reading. You're not going to be a good reader. So you have to change that perspective, change that attitude, and mix up your reading so that there are times where you are truly just reading for pleasure. Make certain you incorporate in that into your reading library and your child's. Set a timer and break up reading assignments with planned breaks. We talk about a lot of times how having that break in between uh, really does help with focus. And the Pomodoro technique is a great technique to use. This is where that university professor, he would work with his college students and they'd have a big assignment. And in order to help the students be more efficient and produce more and be less distracted, he would set his little Pomodoro timer that he had for his kitchen timer. And uh, they set it for 15 minutes. And then when that 15 minutes ended, they'd get a little mini break and then set the Pomodoro timer again. And it's shown that people are much more productive because they don't get overwhelmed. Remember when we talked about processing speed and they get so overwhelmed at the task at hand, you're not overwhelmed. We're just going to work. We're going to read for this 15 minute block of time. And then after the 15 minutes, we're going to take a little mini break and then we're going to work for another 15 minutes. So schedule blocks of time and plan those breaks. You also may want to teach how to sub-vocalize. That's reading quietly aloud because individuals who are auditory learners often benefit from reading aloud softly to themselves. And this is usually a technique done with younger readers and it really does help them. Uh, it is something that you will eventually want to move away from because it does slow down the reading process. But in those early stages, it's a good idea to teach them how to sub-vocalize. And last but not least, turn off or mute at least all devices. And I know you think I can't turn my phone off, you know, because I need it for work. But there are times during the day, even if it's before bed, where you can turn off all distractions. So try to really reflect on that and think about times where you can truly turn off all distractions and just focus on reading, focus on that process. And that will really help you because all of those devices around you are designed to distract you. So make certain that when you really need to read, you make certain that you turn off all of those distractions. And I also want to remind you that real books are there. Remember these? Remember actually feeling a book and the smell of a book? These really do still exist. So remember, it's important to still go back to real books. You know, over the last year or so, many of our students have only been reading online. And it's so important to still incorporate real books into the process, not just for children, but for adults as well. There are a lot of benefits from reading from real books. And you absorb more information. A study out of Italy actually showed that readers who are reading from print 
books, real books, absorbed and remembered more of the plot than readers from eBooks. Also, an earlier study showed that print readers scored higher in empathy, immersion in the book, and understanding the narrative. And scientists think that it's that tactile sensation of actually holding the book and turning the pages. And by turning the pages, it's like you're unfolding the story, literally and figuratively, right? So it is important. It does help you absorb and remember and get more involved in the book. It's also, of course, easier to focus because ebooks are designed to distract you, as I said. So there are links and there are advertisements that are there to help you, right? Um, but they really are not a help. They're oftentimes just a distraction. Uh, and regular books, these books where you actually have to just read the words that are on the page and there's nothing to click on, those are designed for focus. And the lack of distracting links allow you to actually go for deeper reading because you're not trying to multitask and it improves your processing. Plus, an added bonus is no eye strain. A lot of individuals are on the computer all day long and it does strain our eyes. And there are some features on e-readers that help with that, but a regular book, there's no eye strain. And you can even read it out in the sun, much easier. Spatial memory is a big part of print. The stationary text assists in spatial memory. And memory and comprehension in reading involves visual spatial memory. When you can actually visualize, see it in your mind, see where that quote was, see where that text was, it actually helps you remember things about the text. So it encourages that spatial memory. It also helps develop patience. Um, Ebooks are designed for skimming and scrolling where regular books are designed for processing information and really paying attention to detail. And just remember, remember going to the library and the feel of the book and the smell of the books and how you enjoyed that. It's an experience. You become more connected to books. But of course, ebooks are here to stay. And uh, many people enjoy reading from e-readers and online reading sometimes is required. So if it's preferred or if it's required, then there are some steps you can take to help eliminate distractions. Because again, they are designed to distract you, designed to get you off task. So there are things called focus apps. And those are designed to help you build discipline and be less distracted. There are many focus apps available and you can look them up online and decide what will work best for you. It's different than parental blocking because many of you use parental blocking. This is different. A focus app allows you to block a list of websites and or apps. So it also allows you to schedule a time in which you're going to block those. So let's say that you know, as a college student, that you really need to buckle down and you need to study online from 10 o'clock in the morning until noon that day. So with your focus app, you can schedule that block of time where websites like your social media accounts or websites that are unnecessary for you to go to can be blocked. So even if you're tempted and you click on something because you're tempted to go there, those will be blocked for you during that block of time. So it really does help you build the, in that discipline. And they also offer encouragement. I even came across one called the Focus Booster, which builds in the Pomodoro uh, timer. So I thought that was really interesting as well. So that is something that you can start looking into. When you find yourself in a situation where it's really important that you have good productivity, good processing, comprehension of the material you're reading and you need to be efficient, then a focus app can really help with that process. Also, when you're reading online, there is such a thing called the reader view. 
And these really help if you're reading in a browser, because you know, if you are using, let's say Chrome and you bring up an article, there are so many links and advertisements in that article it's hard to stay focused on what you're trying to read. It's hard to not get distracted by the video that's running or the advertisement that's popping up because you just looked at you know, patio furniture and now you're seeing so many different sites for patio furniture, but you really need to read this article. So it's so distracting when you bring things up in a browser. But if you select reader view and uh, Firefox and Safari actually have the reader view built in. Chrome does not have it built in, but there are some extensions that you can use uh, that will actually make your text reader friendly and distraction free. So you'll see here on this page, I gave an example of Mercury Reader. That's one of the Chrome extensions. You can get that at the Chrome store. And if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, this is the article, this is the original article before turning on the extension, okay? So you can see there's so much on that page right now. And then you just click the extension and look on the right-hand side of the screen, how much cleaner it is. It's just text. It's no advertisements, no links for you to click on just the information that you need. So I strongly encourage you to start looking into using Reader View if you're doing Safari or Firefox, or at least get an extension for Chrome to help you. Play attention can also help, right? We've been talking about all of these different cognitive skills necessary to be a good learner and those areas we have to improve, but how do we improve them? That's where play attention comes in. Play attention, of course, has our NASA inspired body wave technology. And on the back of the armband, you see those are those three sensors. And those sensors monitor your brain activity that tells us how attentive you are. And then that information is given over to the computer where you're allowed to control all of our cognitive exercises just with your mind, or more specifically, your attentive state alone. And you receive constant and immediate feedback as to whether or not you truly are focused and paying attention. So we are actually going to allow you to see your attentive state and control your attentive state in real time. And as you are controlling your attention, you're going to be working on all of these cognitive skills, attention, stamina, and task completion. We work on processing speed, filtering distractions, working memory. Sound familiar, these cognitive skills? These are all of the skills we need in order to be successful learners, in order to have strong executive function. We work on impulse control, spatial memory, visual tracking, and much, much more but we will customize your plan. So that goes back to kind of that focus assessment where we see you know, where you lie as far as your different cognitive skills. And then we customize your plan and pinpoint all of these different cognitive skills that we want to incorporate into your program. And then your personal executive function coach will bring you through a practice session, make sure you're real comfortable with everything and you can start your training. So we are going to specifically design a plan for you, a neurocognitive training plan that will help you develop all of these core cognitive skills that right now may be simply weak for you, but are necessary for reading fluency and reading comprehension. This is one uh, activity that we have within Play Attention as well. So not only do we work on specific cognitive skills, but then we use Academic Bridge to help with transfer and generalization. So this is a really exciting program. And you see my student here, she has the body wave armband on. And she's not working on the computer activities like she typically would in her Play Attention session. She's reading. And you notice that she has that body wave armband on her arm. Now remember, the body wave armband is not monitoring where her eyes are. The body wave armband is monitoring how attentive she is. 
And as long as she's paying attention to her reading, she's able to push that red bar up above the midline and she hears good, great. But right now when she's distracting herself, you see that that red bar goes down below the midline and she hears focus. And then she knows she's not in that state she needs to be in, in order to process the re reading material and finish the assignment. So this is where we're asking her to take all of the skills that she's learned within play attention and apply them to her reading. And we have found that this practice of transfer and generalization, it's no longer mom and dad or the teacher standing over them saying, get back on track, get back on track. It's actually the feedback from the computer, giving them immediate feedback regarding their attentive state helps them develop that self-regulation and self-monitoring they need in order to stay on task during the academic tasks, okay? Great for students, but great for adults as well. We can incorporate all of those different work tasks or academic tasks or reading tasks that you want to personally improve. This is one of our students in uh, one of our learning centers. And I just wanted to show you this because it's really interesting in that he is doing uh, his reading first, and then he is actually going to answer comprehension questions. And I'm going to share my sound here so you can hear. So right here on the left-hand side of the screen, he's just reading. And the computer is giving him feedback regarding his reading and how well he's paying attention to his reading. And then after, they follow up with comprehension questions. And I want you to hear the instructor at the center. He did so well. So for this reading, he got a 92%. And this is his comprehension test, and there was four or five questions in, and you got them all correct. Well done. We're proud of you. So you see, he, she said that in her his reading, he had 92%. That means 92% of the time, he was paying attention to his reading material. That's what that's tracking. The body wave armband is tracking the percentage of time where he is in his peak attentive state. So 92% of the time, he was paying attention to reading. And then she followed up with comprehension questions, and he got 100% on his comprehension questions. So this is a great practice to incorporate into your play attention training. And uh, we can teach you how to do this, whether you're working with clients in a center or if you're doing this at home with your child or with yourself as an adult. Great for transfer and generalization and improving the reading process. He did so. Now let's talk about a couple more strategies to incorporate. I know I've given you a lot of information, um, so I hope it's been helpful, but I do want to review a couple more strategies to keep in mind with the reading process. And one is to incorporate high, low literature. And this is often literature that's overlooked, but it's really important because it will provide your child or your students with age appropriate material at a low reading level, okay? Because you don't want to, let's say you have a 12 year old, okay? And your 12 year old struggles with reading. So he's reading on a third grade level. That child does not want to read a book that looks and sounds as if it's designed for a third grader because he's 12. He's much older than that. And so high-low literature provides content that's appropriate for a 12-year-old, but it's at a lower reading level. So this really helps build reading fluency, improves vocabulary, which the more vocabulary we have, the better our comprehension and it inspires a love of reading. They don't feel like you're you know, giving them a baby book that you hear a lot, that you're giving them material that they can relate to, that they are intrigued by and want to read, but it's something at their level. It builds that confidence. So when you're looking at effective high-low literature, and you can find this literature, you can look at Scholastic or even Amazon, type in, high-low literature, 
And what you're looking for are illustrations to support the text, because when you have uh, difficulty with reading, remember they're going to use illustrations to help decode, to help make predictions, to help with the comprehension of the material. You also want carefully chosen vocabulary. So introducing new vocabulary, but not too much new vocabulary that's over their heads. Keep the simple sentences, but they have to be compelling stories for that age level. Also, you want a straightforward plot development. You don't want a lot of foreshadowing. We're not there yet. We still are working on reading process. So not a lot of foreshadowing or looking back. Just keep the plot very straightforward. Characters that interest the reader and the student can relate to issues and topics in the story. So I really encourage you, if you haven't heard of high-low literature, or you haven't incorporated that, it's really useful. And not only high-low literature, but also the use of audiobooks are really important when reading. Because when you can use audiobooks in your reading, you are increasing word exposure exposure and you improve their vocabulary. Because remember, students can listen and comprehend at least two grade levels above their reading level. So even if they're reading at a sixth grade level, you can listen and understand and learn new vocabulary, expose them to new vocabulary that's maybe on an eighth or ninth grade level. And audiobooks allow you to do that. It also reduces working memory deficits. It removes the printed word decoding anxiety, because remember we talked about that avoidance and if they're having a hard time with decoding, they might have a little bit of anxiety when it comes to having to read. So when you say, we're not gonna read the book today, you're going to listen to the book, it takes out that anxiety. It also teaches pronunciation, increases reading accuracy by 52%, improves comprehension by 76%, and if you combine print and audio, it increases recall by 40% over print alone. So that's really important. You don't want it to be the only thing you do in your reading, but have it as part of your reading program because it really is important. And of course, again, just like high-low literature, when you can get them involved, it promotes a love of literature. We have a really exciting program called Media Player within Play Attention. And uh, this is a great application. If you're a current client and you're here now, uh, you will use your body wave armband. So it's a program that you're going to install separately from your Play Attention cognitive exercises. So it's going to be a separate install, but you're still going to utilize your body wave technology. Because remember, we're still going to activate everything with your attentive state. But in Media Player, you're actually activating media files. So if you have a video or if you have an audio book, you can import that into Media Player and you're going to activate that audio book with your attentive state. So this is an example. I took a screenshot of my Media Player and I had imported a story and it had the graphics um, and it had, it was an audio book. So I got the print and the audio. And remember we said, if you allow them to have both, it increases comprehension and recall. So this particular file that I imported had the visual and the audio component. Now I had that body wave armband on. And once I was in that attentive state, once I was at my maximum attentive state, the audio file began. And as long as I was paying attention, I was actively engaged in the reading process, in the listening to that reading book, then the book continues. If I get distracted, if I start thinking about what's for dinner or what am I going to do tomorrow, then the audio book stops. It waits for me to focus in and it won't start again until I focus. So this is a great way. It's fun, but it also makes certain that you're 
actually actively engaged in the learning process, whether it's audio instruction, it could be an audio book, it could be a TED talk that you've imported, it could be video instruction. Let me show you one of our clients here. This is one of our clients and he actually imported um, an audio instruction that he was taking for a course at university. And you'll notice that there's an orange bar in the right-hand side of the screen. And on his right arm, he has the body wave armband on. When he is in his maximum attentive state, that orange bar goes up to the right and the audio continues. But notice when he just got distracted there, that bar went down to the left and it stopped. It waited for him to focus back in because he was taking some notes, waited for him to focus back in and then the instruction started again. We know that the very first catalyst necessary for brain change is attention. So it's critical that if you are listening to an audiobook or you're listening, you're engaged in some type of video instruction, you have to be actively engaged. You have to be paying attention in order to get maximum benefit. So with Media Player, we actually make certain that the audio file or the video file is only playing if you are paying attention, if you are actively engaged. So this is a great supplement to your program. Now, we don't provide you with the audio file or the video files, right? Because you all have different needs and different levels. So any audio file or video file that you want to import that you have on your device, you can import and then utilize your body wave armband in order to activate media player. So the media player itself is usually $149, but with the webinar special as well, you can receive that half price. And we're running that through uh, May 14th where you get media player for half price. And I think now is a great time and start incorporating that into your summer reading program. I also developed an ebook that talks about how to develop your own audiobook. And uh, so if you would like this ebook on your DIY audiobook, how to create your own audiobook library, please do type in audio ebook in the chat box and we'll make certain that you get that. Um, this is just a fun activity that you can use and you can do individually or you could do as a family. And uh, I have some different ideas on how to use Zoom and actually record yourself talking and reading the book or showing the pictures, showing the text if you want to. Um, so I have some ideas on that and I've incorporated it into this ebook so that you can start developing your own audiobook library that you can share with your family or your friends. And so again, if you would like that audiobook ebook, please do type in ebook and we'll get that out to you. So let's summarize. When we talk about the reading process, remember we started with ADHD and reading comprehension and recall. What is the connection? How does ADHD affect the reading process? And remember, we talked about how it isn't necessarily reading. Your child or you may know how to read. It's just these underlying skills that right now are weak. So we need to improve focus. We need to improve processing speed and working memory and impulse control, filtering distractions. When you can strengthen those core cognitive skills, then you'll see improvements in the reading process. I hope that gives you a little bit more perspective, maybe a little bit more clarity on how ADHD is actually affecting the learning process, the reading process, and some steps that you can take now in order to start improving those cognitive skills. Uh, remember, we will have part two, and in part two, I am planning on providing you even more tips and strategies that you can incorporate. And remember, if you want to write in some suggestions 
or some questions for that next webinar, please do. And we'll take those into account as well. So here's some next steps. Next week's Play Attention webinar is, I'm, I'm sorry, not next week, but the following week, how to improve executive function and self-regulation. So we're going to talk about how Play Attention integrates the latest research in neuroplasticity and NASA-inspired technology to improve executive function and self-regulation. So if you'd like to attend that webinar, please do type in Play Attention webinar and we will get you registered. Also, as you know, many of you have been attending our Make ADHD Your Superpower webinar series. Uh, we are continuing this. We are on part four, I believe now. And the next topic on May 20th is going to be hyperfocus. So if you'd like to attend that hyperfocus, uh, you can type in hyperfocus on uh, in the chat box or go to playattention.com and schedule yourself for the upcoming special webinar. Uh, again, I, re I mentioned that focus assessment, if you want to have your specific cognitive skills assessed and talk about those different areas and make a plan to improve, uh, then just type in uh, focus and we will offer you that focus assessment at half price. We do have one-on-one -on -one consultations as well. Of course, you're going to receive a consultation if you do the focus assessment. Um, if you don't need the focus assessment, you wanna just do the consultation, we are available for that. We'll talk about your different strengths and weaknesses, the areas you want to improve and develop a customized executive function training plan for your review. Also, if you want that DIY audiobook ebook, type in ebook and we'll get that out to you. And Media Player, that fun activity where we're going to integrate audio files or video files with our body wave technology, uh, that is going to be half price through May 14th. And I believe that is everything. Oh, and of course, stay tuned for the reading webinar part two. So thank, I do thank everyone for attending today. I really do appreciate your time and your attention. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Take care everyone and thank you so much.